You can take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app, and I'm going to invite you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is our text, and uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. If you're at Sweetwater or McCulloch, if you're in Parker, then there's a table with uh, Uh, Bibles on the back, just stand up and go grab one of those. And as always, if you're at any of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. Hey, it is good to be home. Uh, I had the privilege of taking my wife on a trip for our 35th wedding anniversary, and we got to, uh, yeah... I'm not sure if I got applauded for taking my wife on a trip, uh, for being home, or for celebrating 35 years uh, of marriage, but I don't care. It was all good, So, uh, and all of that is good. But you know what? It doesn't matter where you go in the world. There's no place like home, and it's great to be back, and, uh, and it's great to know that you can leave things in great hands with a great team, and, uh, and yet it's good to be home with you. Hey, there's a, there's a couple of things I want to just mention uh, that I am excited about and, uh, and they, one I just found out about when I got home, and the other uh, I'm, I'm uh, excited about because it's this weekend. The first one is this. You know, uh, a couple of months ago we mentioned we're in partnership with Compassion International. We're sponsoring uh, a, a Compassion Center in Honduras, uh, building the building, uh, trying to furnish it. And when I got back, I just asked, hey, what's the status? What's the update? We have fully funded the building part of that Compassion building. And, yeah. I celebrate the fact that, that I get to be part of a church that is generous and that believes in blessing people that are, are way uh, outside of our normal track of life and you are, you are helping to feed people and introduce them to Jesus Christ and that is awesome. And by the way, if you're interested, we're going to be taking a trip uh, down to dedicate the building and to see kids that we're sponsoring next March. So if you're interested in more information, it's going to be in your bulletin or you can email serve at calvarylhc.com, calvaryaz.com. We will uh, get you that, that information as quickly as we have it all nailed down. Uh, the other thing that I'm really excited about is happening tomorrow afternoon, and uh, Pastor Robert already mentioned the lake baptisms. Uh, not only are we doing lake baptisms here in Lake Havasu, but we're doing lake or river baptisms down in Parker. And so uh, if you are at any of our services on Saturday or Sunday, and you are thinking, hey, you know what? I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I know I'm forgiven by Jesus. I know I, I belong to him. And yet you have never declared your faith publicly in baptism. This is an opportunity for you to be obedient to Jesus Christ. And we would love to help you take that step of obedience and proclaim your devotion, your allegiance to Jesus. And so if you know your life's been changed and you haven't yet done that, then uh, grab one of the connection cards and sign up or find one of the pastors after the service and say, hey, put me on the list for tomorrow or just show up. Okay, now in Parker, you guys are going to have to find out uh, exactly where because I can't tell you all the locations. But I know they got two baptisms already scheduled in Parker for tomorrow. And we've got over 20 scheduled for here in Lake Havasu tomorrow. So, uh, yeah. So you guys are clapping. Show up and celebrate with us. It's going to be a lot of fun. And if you don't know where this is, it's right across the bridge, first left. Okay, go down past the dog park and you'll find us. We're going to have a party. We're going to celebrate. uh, And it's at 4 o'clock. We're going to baptize right at 4.30. So uh, you can plan on being there in time and enjoying the day. Hey, we're continuing our series called Upside Down. We are looking at the teaching of Jesus because if we apply his teaching to our life, it will turn our lives upside down. It'll change them radically. And uh, I love what we're talking about this weekend uh, because it's truth. How many of you have ever said something like this or uh, been a part of a conversation that was like this? I swear it's true. I I swear, I promise it's true. I swear on my mother's grave. Your mother's not dead. (laughs) Oh, wait, oh, okay. Still, I swear. Uh, I, you know, uh, I pinky swear. Right? Pinky swear. I cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. I don't know who came up with that, but they are sick puppies. <laughs> ah, it doesn't count. I had my fingers crossed. Right? You heard, you heard that stuff too. Or how about, 
Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. You see, we want to know the truth. And, 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 and so we try to force other people or we try to, you know, convince other people that we are going to be truthful. And we use extra language to try to make it, you know, uh, this, this, this powerful thing. Oh, you, I swear it's true. What do you want me to swear on? What do you want me to swear by? I'll, I'll make it true so you can trust me. We want to know if other people are telling the truth. We want to know if they're being truthful. But how do we know? Because we want to know the truth. Even when we can't handle the truth, we want to know it. But we live in a culture that has been overwhelmed by spin. You guys notice that? I mean, everybody's got to spin on their version of truth. I mean, they, you know, people are trying to rewrite history. Uh, you know, you've got fact-checking organizations that are more interested in viewpoint than reality. I mean, it's getting to the point where we need lawyers to say hello. Right? Put it down in print so that they, only the, the professionals can interpret it. And even that uh, has two viewpoints about what, you know, it means. So how are we supposed to live in a culture where truth is less valued than perception or my viewpoint? Well, if we want to know how to live in that kind of a culture, we need to listen to Jesus. Because he has something to say to us. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 33. If you grab one of the Bibles, it's page 963. If you haven't found Matthew 5, 963 is the page we're on. This is what Jesus says. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Now, this passage has been used in, in a lot of different ways. There are some religious groups that won't, you know, swear at the, you know, in court that they're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth because of this passage. Uh, there are some religious groups that won't make the Pledge of Allegiance because they feel like it's violating this passage. Uh, but what this passage is really all about is integrity. This is about integrity. Think about what Jesus said. Let your yes or your, let your, what you say be yes or no. I grew up the King James, let your yes be yes and your no be no. In other words, speak the truth. Be trustworthy. Be believable. Be honest. You know, most of the teaching that Jesus is doing here is based off of the Ten Commandments about do not murder, do not commit adultery, uh, do not steal. And, and he gets to that point about false witness. And what he's saying is, hey, be a true witness. Don't be a false witness. Don't, don't be somebody who's full of falsehood and lies, but be somebody who is a person of integrity. And, and if we really want Jesus to change our lives, if, if we want Jesus to turn our lives upside down, then we need to know that our words matter. Your words matter. Uh, just simply yes or no. Uh, Jesus had a lot more to say about words than just this. And, and later on in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, if you want to look it up, at verses 34 through 37, Jesus is talking primarily to religious leaders and he says, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. 
For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Can I, can I just stop right there and, and, and go, does that give anybody else the willies in this room? Our words matter. Jesus just kind of said, hey, guys, you, you, you can pretend all you want to be a good person. You, you can say you're a good person. You can say you love God. You can say you're faithful. But it's your words that are going to prove your life. By your words, they're going to understand who you really are, justified and condemned. We're going to give an account. Your words matter. Your words matter to Jesus. Think about it. The Word of God tells us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, who calls on the name of the Lord, Jesus, will be saved. Your words matter. We're going to celebrate baptisms tomorrow afternoon with a bunch of people who said, Jesus is my Savior. Their words, their declaration matters. The Apostle Paul said, if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. It begins with that confession, that declaration. Hey, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. You talk to me about baptism after the service. I'm going to ask you, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? You're going to say, yes, he is. Or you're going to say, no, he isn't. That's a declaration. Your words matter. And, and if we claim relationship with Jesus, if we say we're followers of Jesus, then we have to ask ourselves this question. Do your words matter? match your life do your words match your life i honestly hope this is a question that you kind of ponder not just for the next few minutes but for the next week i hope you and god have some conversation about you and your words and whether your words match your confession of faith in jesus christ if your words match your life so do your words match your life at home? Safe place, right? That's where the home is. We can be yourself. Let your guard down. Be natural. Be relaxed. So when you're at your most honest, do your words match your life? Do your words match your, your you know, confession about Jesus being Lord of your life uh, when you're having conversation with your spouse? Do you tend to communicate um, love or hate? Do you tend to build up or tear down? Do you ask questions or do you make accusations? Do you encourage or do you criticize and condemn? You see, do our words match our lives with our spouses? What about with our children? With your children, do you encourage or do you criticize? Do, do, you, do you bless them or do you curse them? Because every time we open our mouth, we have an opportunity to do both. Are, are you building them up? Or are you tearing them down? Are you speaking love? Are you speaking anger? Are you speaking annoyance? Are, they, are you communicating they're just a bother? You see, we need to ask ourselves these questions because... Our words matter in our lives. And this is a question about integrity. See, our words matter. So do your words match your life at work? Or what about when you're out on the lake? Or golf course? Or shopping? Hey, how about this? Are people shocked when they find out you go to church? You ever had one of those where you're like, yeah, what are you doing? Oh, I got to go to church. You go to church? <laughs> Seriously? I mean, is that, that's an uncomfortable conversation if somebody's shocked when they find out. Or how about this one? This one occurred to me. It's a totally unfair question, but it's worth thinking about and maybe even having conversation about. If your conversations with other people, okay, I'm not even talking about talking to yourself but if your conversations with other people recorded during the week, could we play them here? <laughs> like somebody, see, you've got confessions going on already. Sometimes, some of them, if I can pick and choose. I don't know how, I mean, it's just one of those, those things that occurred to me. 
our conversations, our careless words, we're going to give an account for. So if, if we were just recorded, how would we feel about, you know, hitting the play button in front of our friends or in front of our pastors or in front of our church? Because everything we say is in front of our God. And he's the one that real, whose opinion really ought to matter a whole lot more than each other's. You see, our words matter. In fact, Jesus' brother, uh, half-brother, the Apostle James, uh, you may be familiar with him. He wrote a book in the New Testament called James. Uh, it's a great book. I recommend it. Uh, if you're reading through the New Testament with us, you're going to read it. Uh, he said this in the third chapter. He said, with our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be. He, he points out our inconsistencies about how we stand together and we sing and we praise God and we offer up these beautiful songs and words of praise about how great is our God. And then we walk out the doors and we curse people who are made in God's likeness, whom Jesus died for. And James just goes, hey, we're, we're being duplicitous. We're being, you know, hypocritical because with our mouth, on one moment we're praising God and with the next we're cursing people that he loves. So do your words match your life? Do they match your confession about Jesus? Because this is about integrity. This is about our hearts. This is about who we are. Now, understand, all of us, have evil hearts, okay? I hope that doesn't offend you. The Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked above our, everything else. Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul says we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. None, is, none of us is righteous, not even one. So there, there's plenty of scriptural evidence that, that all of us are evil, okay? We've all got evil in our hearts. And, and if you question that, all you have to do is just hang out with little children, Okay? Because I don't know a single parent in this world who's ever intentionally taught their child to lie, and yet they all do it. Right? First time you catch them doing something wrong, right? Who did that? Not me. Who did that? I don't know. They can, they can have their hand in the cookie jar or in the drawer. Or in, what are you doing? Nothing. Okay, we, we, we're natural born sinners and part of that is being deceitful. And so we all have this wickedness in our hearts. Uh, and, and if we're honest, we all think evil thoughts. We all have those evil thoughts in our hearts too. But hopefully this is about exercising self-control and discipline and not speaking that evil out. So integrity is found in our actions, in our words, matching the confession that we've made to say that we belong to Jesus, we love Jesus. So here's some questions for you and God to talk about, uh, if you will, an integrity inventory. Just some thoughts that came to, to my mind. Maybe they'll help you figure out this, this word and deed matching kind of thing, since it's a matter of integrity. So would you rather lose fairly or win by cheating? And yes, family games count. <laughs> right? Because that's where you're teaching people how to, how to do life. Uh, will you keep your word even if it costs you money? It's amazing how many people are, you know, absolutely strong on integrity until it costs a few dollars. Uh, if you're given too much change in a store, do you keep it? Or return it? Do you point out that they made a mistake and give it back to them? Um, that's, that's a question of integrity. Or how about this one? Totally unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Are you honest with your spouse or do you tell them little white lies? See, all of us want to go, well, I'm honest. Really? Are you truthful about your late night internet activities? Are you truthful about how much you spent? Not how much you saved, but how much you spent. 
Are you truthful about how you're feeling about the marriage? Because it's so easy to do to our spouse what we do to people when we're greeting each other in church and just say, I'm fine. Everything's fine. And we don't want to be honest about our feelings because it'll be uncomfortable. Uh, but that just leads us to a place of disaster. You see, this is about integrity. And Jesus calls us to truth. Let everything be just be yes and no. Can we be people of truth? Don't try to deceive. Don't try to qualify. Don't try to mislead. Don't try to spin. And, and this is really challenging because of the culture that we live in and because of the way we're, we're you know, natural-born sinners. And yet this is absolutely essential for followers of Jesus. So let's just be really clear here. If you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment personally to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord, okay? If you've done that, then you've got to grab hold of this, this absolute necessity for integrity and truth because we cannot represent the truth unless we are honest people. This is absolutely essential. You see, Jesus said, and a lot of you know this, I am the way, I am the truth, and I'm the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus identified himself not just as knowing the truth or speaking the truth, but as being truth incarnate. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen truth. If you talk to me, you talk to truth. If I'm speaking, it's truth. He, he embodied truth. So when, when we talk about Jesus being truth, we're talking about in the flesh. He's incapable of lying. There is no falsehood in him. And then we, as his followers, have been given the responsibility by Jesus to represent him to the world. To represent him as the embodiment of truth to the world. And our goal is to lead them to that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that we have experienced ourselves so that they can be forgiven, so that they can be made new, so that Jesus can turn their lives upside down, so that they can have eternal life and know that heaven is their destiny. That's the goal. That's the, the, the mission, if you will. But you can't share the truth with people if you're living a lie. It doesn't work. It's not going to be effective. You can't just go and try to convince people to believe your version of the truth, because that's how they see it, if your life doesn't match it. Does that make sense to you? Do you, do you understand that, that part of the problem of the church in the United States of America today is the fact that for a long time, we tried to do just that. We tried to tell people the truth while we weren't living the truth. We tried to tell people here's the standard when we didn't live the standard. We tried to tell people this is who Jesus is when our lives didn't reflect who Jesus was. And so we lost credibility. We lost authority. Because that is hypocrisy. That's why this is so significant. And churches have been so guilty of, of doing this. And, and, and if you didn't grow up in church, sometimes that's, that's a bonus. If you grew up in church, I learned a lot about Jesus in church. I learned a lot about God. I, I was taught well uh, both from my parents and in church, the Bible stories and, and encouraged to read. And, and I met Jesus, and I thank God for that. But I learned a lot of stuff that wasn't from the Bible there too. And a lot of it has to do with this hypocrisy, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that the church was full of lies. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll say that, and, and I can call it out, uh, and I won't name names. But, but I've been in business meetings where people flat out attacked another person, and they, and they covered it all in nice religious speak, but they were just simply trying to ruin somebody's life. And people sat by and let them do it rather than calling them out and saying, those are lies, and, and you need to repent. And I go, well, you know, we don't want to judge anybody, and yet we watch them bludgeon somebody's reputation with lies. Where, where's the authority? Where's the truth in that? Where's the yes and no in that? Let's be honest about our motives. 
I, I've, I've sat there and, and watched as, as people gossiped and slandered uh, about brothers and sisters, about you know, people in leadership, about fellow servants of Christ, uh, and they didn't have any facts. They just felt like something was. And they used spiritual language to do it. Well, I just have the sense of the Spirit leading. You know. No, you don't, you're just, just guessing and gossiping. And slandering has nothing to do with truth. I've watched as, as people who call themselves followers of Jesus are just flat out mean to people. Rude, ugly, you know, uh, and, and yet love is what? Kind. And we wonder why people don't want to listen to us. We wonder why the, they, they, they just disregard the truth of Jesus Christ. You see, we cannot represent the truth of Jesus unless we live honest lives as honest people. And so at Calvary, our mission is really clear. We exist. The whole reason we exist as a church, everything we do is because we want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why we're going to have a party at the lake and at the river. We're going to celebrate life change. See, that's our mission, and, and we're committed to that, absolutely and unequivocally. But our methods are also clear. They're wrapped up in our mission statement as well. We exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, first of all, through the love of his people. The love of his people. Now, we're going to talk more about this next week, uh, a, a lot more in depth next week in the message, but on the subject of truth, Jesus desires our honesty, but he doesn't require brutal honesty. You guys know anyone who just loves to be brutally honest? They delight in it. They consider it a virtue to be brutally honest. And yet um, the Apostle Paul said, speak the truth in love. That's not brutal honesty. That's loving honesty. There's a big difference between the two. Sometimes that loving honesty has a brutal side to it, but there's relationship that's a part of that. There's relationship that is there. It's not just something you're offering up to strangers as they pass by. So through the love of his people, the love of his people, we're, we want to love people. Love is patient, love is kind. We just established that. And so if we're going to be loving toward people, that means we're going to be kind toward people. Uh, and, and that's absolutely essential if we're going to lead people to Jesus. But the second part of that is this. We're going to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. Now we're talking about truth. And I want you to know there's power in truth because Jesus Christ can change your life. I don't care who you are, what you've been through, what you're facing, what you're confronting, how you've messed life up. Jesus can change your life. He can redeem your circumstances. He can, now understand, he will turn your life upside down, but he will heal your relationships. He'll alter your family. He will redeem your life. He's the truth and he can do that. There is power in truth. And by the way, that's why at Calvary, we preach and teach the Word of God. We want you to know the Bible. We want you to read it. We want you to study it. We want you to learn it. We want you to memorize it. We want you to speak it. Why? Because it's God's Word. There's power here. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. I, I you know... I love scripture. I love teaching scripture. But here's what I know. If you read it, if you study it, if you learn it, God will change your life. You see, here at Calvary, we believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. Period. And we're unap unapologetic about it. We're not going to apologize for teaching God's word, even though our culture is not really fond of scripture. Unless, of course, it suits their version of the truth. And, uh, and I just want you to know, even if, I don't want to say when, but even if teaching Scripture becomes illegal or is called a hate crime, we're still going to do it. Yeah, we have to teach the truth because the gospel is the power of the Word of God unto salvation. There is no other option. If God has changed your life, then, then this is his word and you, and you want to offer it to other people. But understand, that's why 
we cannot represent Jesus unless we're honest people. This is mission central. This isn't one of those optional things where we go, yeah, I know I should be more truthful. I know I got to work on that. This is about who we are as the people of God so that we can have the power of God reside through us to accomplish the mission of God here in Lake Havasu, in Parker, and to the ends of the earth. It's that simple. This is that critical. So we need to be people of truth. We need to be people of integrity. We need to be people who are trustworthy. And if we embrace truthfulness, if we embrace integrity as a radical lifestyle, I just want you to know it will turn your life upside down. It will be uncomfortable. It will change your marriage. It'll change your career. And it'll infuse them all with the power of God. But it will not be easy to get there. It will not be comfortable to get there. Do you know what you have to do to actually get to a place of living out integrity, living out the truthfulness that we're talking about? Is that you have to actually acknowledge the lies that you've told. You have to actually acknowledge when you're going, hey, you know, my temptation is to uh, not tell the truth. I, I was tempted. I was just a, a couple of days ago, I was filling out a survey, right, from, a, you know, part of our vacation. You know, tell us how you did. And I realized that I was tempted to lie to bless somebody who had taken care of us. It, it just, it, it's, it permeates everything that we do. It's so easy sometimes just to go ahead and, and be false to protect someone or protect a feeling or do something. And, and, and we need to understand that it's not going to be comfortable to be truthful. There's going to be confession involved. But it is worth the struggle. It is worth the discomfort. It is worth the effort. Because God will change your life. And God will empower your life. And God will revolutionize your relationships. Because your yes and your no will mean something. So do your words match your life? I pray they do. But if they don't, and that conversation you have with God is uncomfortable, what are you going to do about it? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that your word is true. I thank you that your word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And you know how easy it is for us to be deceitful, false liars. And we want to be people of truth and so right now we need your grace to move through this room, to be poured out in our lives as we confess our falsehood, as we confess our, our temptation to, to deceive. We need to know that your grace is enough to forgive us. And God, we need your power, your courage, so that we can speak the truth in love constantly in, in every situation, in every relationship. And Lord, is there some people in this room right now who are thinking about making changes in their lives to be people of the truth? I pray that you would just affirm them. Let them know that it'll be worth the pain to get there. God, you're the one who can change us. And so we invite the truth of God to penetrate our lives so that we can be people of truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.